your hometown, Wolverhampton, yeah. we're in Wolves Stadium. What does this stadium and, you know, Wolverhampton mean to you? It's crazy, man, because like I used to actually work here and I'd sit here legit some days and eat my lunch here in this. I worked in this stand. So in I this sit, stand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the warehouse, which is hidden in there somewhere. There's no <laughs> windows in there, man. It's a little dungeon. I'm joking. But um, no, I'd come and sit here and just eat my lunch and just take it in because it's like a crazy view. The pitch looks amazing because it's a small city. Everyone kind of knows everyone. We're all kind of in a close knit community. So that definitely shows in the music. It's raw, it's real. I don't try and put no fakeness into it, you know? It's a real city, man. It's, um, yeah. So You've I think always lived it, haven't you? Always born and bred, yeah. So growing up, what was, you know, like Little Essex like? Like, did he play <laughs> at school, beatboxing, I hear? Yeah, like, yeah. What yeah. is that? How did that all come about, you know, from there to now? I think when I was a young kid, I wasn't very confident. I didn't have a lot of confidence to, to do the things that maybe I realised or didn't realise at the time I wanted to do. But it wasn't until I kind of got into high school. But when I found out you could make beats on a computer, not this big studio or whatever, I didn't even know what making beats was, but like when I found out you can do that, game changer, man. Like, it's changed my life. I made my first beat when I was like 11 or 12, and. I'm still making them today, so. Which was a huge beat as well. Well, I made the beat when I was 15 and we just, I'd put it in the folder of beats. And then two years later, I was 17, it, we just came across it randomly in the, one of the folders and everyone just started like freestyling to the beat, even me. And I didn't even MC or, or rap or anything. And it took off as one of the biggest grime instrumentals of all time today. And that's, you know, that's before you were even 18? Before I was 18, man. Before I was 18, I was producing for the likes of Skepta, Chipmunk, Tiny Temper, you know, the biggest people in the country and out of the, my house in Wolverhampton. <laughs> so you've worked with some of these, these huge names, as you were saying, traveling outside of Wolverhampton. Um, who's your favorite? Oh, I always say Childish Gambino because it was an experience where he flew me to his place in America, um, in LA a huge mansion that he was renting from, I think it was the Miami Heat player, Chris Bosch. I got to really see how he lives. I got to experience like being around his friends, become a friend. When you like, you're traveling to work with these people and then you, do you always have in the back of your mind, I'm coming back to Wolverhampton, I'm coming back to Wolverhampton? Yeah, but I always feel like I'm coming home. You know, there's a saying like, if you know, but when you're on the M6 coming into Wolverhampton, there's the RAC building on the right. That's when you know you're home. That's when it hits me, I'm like, yeah, I'm back, you know? Um, <laughs> I love it here, man. I, I live here, my family's here. How does it feel to go from that, that point right up until this point? It feels uh, self-rewarding in a sense that I knew I was right. <laughs> I knew it would work out, you know. Um, I, my only goal in music was like to see how far I could take it and produce a song for Lil Wayne, you know. And I did that when I was 19, man. So it was just like, for me at that point, I was like, life's done. Life's complete, man. I didn't know what to do. I was just... <laughs> When you're 19, you're like, yeah, yeah, I've killed it, I've done it. You know, I didn't realise I had a whole life ahead of me. I think it fully comes down to self-belief. Like, this is what I had to realise for me. Like, you can be the greatest, you can know that you're a great musician, but it's about having self-belief that you can actually do the things that you want to do with it, you know. I put out my first song as an artist in March 2017. And if you listen to that, can you swear on here? Or I mean, do it, we can bleep it. it, it <laughs> you know, it just is like, I know where, how much I've grown from the recording quality, the lyrics, the singing, the performance. If you listen to that song, it's called Wrong For You. Go listen to it right now. Pause this video, go listen to it on Spotify. And then come back to this video. And then come back to it. <laughs> and then listen to my latest song, It's Over Now. And the album, Things Change. And then you'll just hear the difference. But That was a link. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to do it too. They'll be like, all right, pause that. Go to that one. Yeah, go back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I seriously just like, I'm proud of how much I've grown and I've done it publicly. I was never afraid to like put out a song and be like, oh yeah, I'm the guy, man, check me out. I'm, I want to know what people think. People, I want to hear the criticism and see how I can grow and get better. And things change. Yeah, things change. <laughs> Which The debut just, album. That's a very <laughs> good way to link it in. Yeah. Things change. I wanted to talk about the name. So yeah. how did that come about? It's a very kind of personal to you, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's adaptable to anyone and people can relate to that title friends that reveal their true um, uh, identity, I guess you could call it. I'd also say the pandemic was a huge part of the, re the meaning behind this album. You know, not being able to tour, make music the same way, 
Um, the whole juxtaposition in the music industry was crazy. Couldn't really release music, couldn't really make music, couldn't really feel motivated, you know, like it was, it was hard. But to come out of it with the things that I went through personally on top of all of us as a world <laughs> going through a pandemic, you know. Um, I'm just glad to be coming out of it with a body of work that I'm proud of. You know, I'm proud to say it's my debut album. And yeah, things things change. <laughs> All of my songs are sad boy songs, man. <laughs> they're, they're hurt lyrics with meaning, but the beats are upbeat and it makes you feel good. It's just honest work, you know, it's honest. Stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a true representation of where I've been over the last two years, you know. I think you put a video on YouTube where you were quite open about your mental health. Yeah, Does yeah. that come into your music a lot and, and also your sort of your presence really, social it's, media? Yeah, it's something I deal with in life, man. So maybe I have to remind myself, maybe it is just that that I'm going through, you know, and yeah, I don't pressure myself, man. Like if I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling it for a reason, you know. Um, as you get bigger in music and there's more pressure on, especially from a label or like just to do things a certain way, it's quite, it can be quite daunting, man. There's days where I just don't want to post nothing, man. I don't want to show my life. I'm not feeling too good about me, so why would I want to share it, you know? But then the next day I might look at the same picture that I was going to post and be like, oh yeah, let's share it. It's just, I just don't pressure myself, man, you know? There is this huge pressure. There's actually a TikTok trend like where it says like, POV from the record label, you know, telling artists to make TikToks. It's so real, man. Like, they want you to make TikToks and because if your song rolls up on there, everyone's laughing, we're all winning. You do make TikToks though. I do make TikToks, but I'm not as active on there and I don't do it with the intention to make my song get big. I just, sometimes I don't make TikToks. Sometimes I'm feeling like a joker and I might just do some weird stuff. But I think that's what social media is for, to show people like who I am. You've got the personality as well to go along yeah. with the, the kind <laughs> of with that energy, Thank you know. You. Is that, again, the same thing? Does that yeah. come, you know, naturally to you alongside the music? I've always been a joker, man, so yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess so, I think so. <laughs> Guys! Do you ever not wear shorts? <laughs> Is shorts the only thing? Bro, if you see me wearing trousers, <laughs> I'll let you punch me in the face. Is that now like a trademark? I think so, yeah. I haven't worn trousers for over six years. Now I do buy trousers, but my tailor cuts them into shorts, <laughs> so I've got the exclusive shorts that no one has you know <laughs> what's the craziest experience you've kind of had along this journey that you've gone in music there's so many that it's just like i couldn't tell you like like a pinch myself moment you know honestly man like buying my own property was one of them because to do that off of music in a pandemic when i don't have another job man you know like if i don't make music or go to work i'm not getting paid you know and i'm not the richest man in the world at all so very humble to say buying has. I mean, I would have said, you know, hanging with Lil Wayne or Childish Gambino. <laughs> Those are the things that come to my mind, but I have to really think like, wow, like I've got a forever home no matter what, man, because I, you know, I was blessed to do it. And buying yeah. that property, <laughs> especially like in your hometown as well, yeah. is that, does that make it even more special? For sure, man. Yeah. There is other, there is other like cool moments, but I'll just say, you know, that was one for me. Yeah. I was running back, I knew you right here. 